from the McCourtney Institute for Democracy and the studios of WPSU on the campus of Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam, and this is Democracy Works. Chris, we have a really special guest today. We always have special guests. Mm, always. But today we meet him. No, we always mean it. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a special guest, and, yeah. and we're lucky to have him. Uh, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, Jonathan is a social psychologist. He holds the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership in the uh, Stern Business School at NYU. Uh, but I know what strikes me about so much of Jonathan's work is how interdisciplinary it is. I mean, he's a uh, social psychologist, uh, but he also is uh, informs political science. And, uh, and he teaches at the business school. And he teaches in the business right. school mm-hmm. and, and just all kinds of things brought together, all kinds of uh, strands of thought brought together by, by Jonathan's work. He's looking at the, uh, the importance of uh, polarization. And for him, it's the social psychological roots of polarization about how uh, tribal people are um, by nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, what's become different about American politics, and I, I think he has a nice understanding of this trend in, in politics, is that uh, people have really sorted themselves out uh, across the parties in such a way that Democrats and Republicans are increasingly unlike one another, both in the kinds of values that they uh, bring to their approaches to politics and other things uh, in terms of where they live, in, in terms of the demographics. I mean, we've talked about this in, in various ways. And in terms of how they're informed, how they understand the world, right. how they, they understand the economics, general, politics. The general it, yeah. big sort. But the point is that that uh, um, our objective here in this in this episode... Right, is to see what he has to say about democracy. Right, not is to tie those education. into democracy. Yeah. yeah, and to see, you know, to reflect on... You know, we talk a lot on this um, podcast about how democracy it, it takes work, right? And it's unnatural. And it's um, and Jenna once asked me, you know, you never say what that why you think it's unnatural. And and so I think that is where um, Jonathan's insight is most relevant and helpful, is because he just kind of says, "Here's why," right? Yes, yeah, and he'll talk about that with with Jenna, I'm mm-hmm. sure. Uh, but you know, this idea that. It's in our nature to be tribal. Mm-hmm. The parties have sorted in such a way right. that we're in kind of almost like tribes, although I don't know that he would use the word tribe, but I don't, I don't but know he that might. he wouldn't. But, but he might. Uh, and, and so much of what he concerns him, he sees, he sees there. But I also think he's concerned about, you know, how we're raising our next generation mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. democratic citizens. Right. I, I think that's right. And um, how things that you don't necessarily see as connected – are um, indispensable, right? R- literal. I mean, that if you're going to be a democratic citizen, you have to learn how to work through problems. You have to learn how to uh, hear things you don't want to hear, um, things that you disagree with, and how to disagree without being disagreeable, without getting into fights. And um, he would argue that we haven't done a very good job. Our generation hasn't done a good job of teaching you know, this generation of incoming college students um, how to do those things. And as a result, um, democracy is is worse off. Yes, because we, we didn't follow the directive that I know my mother had, mm-hmm. which was get out of the house right. and don't come back until dinner time. Right, right, right. When uh, the street lights come on, that's when you have to come in. I, I don't know any kid our age that didn't hear that. Right, right. And, and you know, he, he sees that. I, I don't think anybody would argue with, mm-hmm. with that. Anybody that's, you know, involved in raising kids now and... You know, it's like you can't just send them out to play. There's nobody out on the street playing. <laughs> They're all at soccer practice. Right. And 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 he he sees uh, he sees that. You know, he he's one who t- sort of takes that to its implications. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, what what does it mean if we're not just sending kids out to learn how to play by themselves? All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's bring him on, and uh, I'm sure everybody will find him as as interesting as we do. Yeah. This is Jenna Spinelli here today with Jonathan Haidt. John, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Jenna. So, uh, John, you have written, uh, and and we say on this podcast all the time that democracy is hard work. It's not natural. It's not easy. Uh, and I, I think you are perhaps uniquely qualified to help us understand why that is. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's, let's give it a try. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a social psychologist, and I study 
uh, morality. And, and I always try to put everything in both an evolutionary context and a cultural context. You know, there is a human nature. We're products of evolution. But one of the great innovations is that we're actually pretty flexible and humans live in all kinds of ways around the world. And so the way I like to approach the problem is to say, well, how do humans tend to live politically? And as far as I can tell, there are two main ways. There are two ways that are really, really stable and widely found. And so one is uh, egalitarian hunter-gatherers. This is the way all of our ancestors lived for hundreds of thousands or millions of years, depending on how you count it. Um, and before they get settled, before there's agriculture, this is the way all societies are. And then once you take up agriculture, you get hierarchy, and pretty quickly you get something like feudalism. And it emerges on multiple continents, and you know it's really clear in Japan. And so these two ways of living really fit with our psychology. And then there are a bunch of other ways that have been tried, you know, communism, uh, um, communes, um, democracy. And these ways tend to be very short-lived. Um, they tend to be very unstable. Plato said it's the second worst form of government because it always descends into tyranny because the people get par carried away by passions. So democracy is not really such a great thing. What is great is that the people can kick out the government if they don't like it. The people have to have the ability to reject the government if they don't like it. And that was what our founding fathers were really committed to. And so um, they gave us a republic with democratic features. And, you know, look, I'm not a political scientist or an historian. I'm sure I'm getting some details wrong here. But the big picture is that in the 20th century, we developed this obsession with democracy. And I think it's because we fought a war to defend democracy in World War I. And then we did it again in World War II. And, and we all got kind of fooled into thinking that democracy is the greatest thing in the world. And then in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapses, it was clear that democracy won. And there is no alternative. And it's the end of history in every country as it Developed, is going to become a free market liberal democracy just like us. And we were wrong. We were fooled. Democracy is a lot harder, a lot less stable. And now it's clear we, we took it for granted and it's a lot harder than we thought. Right. right. So are there things about the, the way we're wired as people <clears throat> that, that make it so hard or, or so kind of uh, difficult to, to carry out in practice? Yes. The feature, so the founding fathers, in addition to being great historians, I mean, for their era and, and with the limited books that they could get, they really tried hard to study the lessons of history. They were also really good psychologists. Uh, and again, with no research, just reflecting on human nature, as was, as was actually the custom in the, the 18th century, the, the age of enlightenment. I mean, that was really the beginning of good psychology. And this is where my own work comes in. The reason I got into this aspect of political theory <clears throat> is because I study moral psychology. And my research um, basically led me to the view of David Hume that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. So Hume was basically disagreeing with the long rationalist tradition in philosophy, saying all you people who think like, oh, humans are such great reasoners and we're rational and that's our God-given ability, you're just completely wrong. Have you ever looked at a person? Do you relate to any people? We're not like that. And the founding fathers knew that. And so that's why you don't want to have a, something that's too democratic because especially when there are hard times, somebody's going to come along and tell you the reason for our troubles is them. They're the reason. And it's really easy to rally people to hate them and then attack them and kill them. Um, so the Founding Fathers knew that. And as Amer again, I'm not an historian, but it seems as though a lot of the reforms in the progressive era made America more democratic. Now, they were responding to all kinds of corruptions and problems. I'm not saying that the progressive era was wrong. I'm just saying we got a lot more democratic in our reforms in the 20th century and after Watergate as well, various reforms. And some of them may have kind of backfired. And many people will look at the 2016 election uh, and see in many ways uh, uh, the fulfillment of the founding fathers' worst nightmares as they expressed in the Federalist Papers. Right. But, you know, even though you kind of started started to, to touch a little bit on this, this kind of idea of, you know, we're not as rational as we think. And, and even though we all kind of understand that that democracy is so hard, it doesn't really stop us from trying to practice it. Right. We vote and we support the free press and we, you know, we, we go out and, and organize or demonstrate some of us. So what what motivates people to, to do those types of things, even in the face of, of knowing that it is hard and it is, you know, all the things we, we were talking about earlier. So, you know, the founding fathers thought that 
um, democracy. So, you know, we talk about the American experiment, and what it really was, as I understand, it was an experiment in self-government. Because in 1776, there were not a lot of examples, or I think there were none, of people self-governing. It was always either a monarch of some sort or a, or a dictator. Um, and, and I believe they wrote a lot about the need for virtues. So you have to, uh, they definitely wrote about the need for education. They believed a lot in public education. You have to educate people for democracy. You have to have cultivate virtues for democracy. Um, you know, self-control, willingness to follow rules, abide by procedures, accept defeat, compromise. Um, so there are virtues, and then there are institutions. Uh, uh, you know, respect for the for the courts, rule of law, uh, and so if you have all these things, then there's a it's kind of like a playing field on which people can pursue their interests. What they call the pursuit of happiness. Happiness didn't mean joy. It meant the pursuit of a, a well-ordered life in which you are successful and you like your life. It was, it was your condition, your state is what happiness meant. Um, and so people uh, are, you know, Americans have long been known for being individualists. Uh, and de Tocqueville noted how we individualists come together very quickly and easily to solve problems. That was what he noted was really unique about us. Um, so we've always been a democratic people in that sense, um, ready to take things into our own hands, solve problems. And um, America in the, in the you know, 20th century, we certainly see many cases of activism that were like that and that worked. Um, of course, taking things into your own hands can also lead to riots and violence. Um, but uh, we're, we're not a sub subjugated people. We're a, a free people. And uh, you know, our, our political behavior shows that. Mm -hmm. And you know, thinking specifically about the way that we've organized ourselves into political parties here in the U.S., your, your book, the, the Righteous Mind, is, does a great job mm -hmm. of, of going through several moral foundations that, that separate you know, what, what conservatives value versus what, mm -hmm. what liberals value. Can you uh, kind of walk us through what those are and how, how the parties differ mm -hmm. sure. in that way? Sure. Um, so uh, so you know, the founding fathers didn't want political parties, but of course, as soon as the Constitution was proposed, there was one saying yes and one saying no. Um, the worst number of political parties to have in a country is one. Uh, but the second worst number is two, uh, because we are we evolved <clears throat> we evolved for tribal warfare. We evolved to do us versus them, and research shows that if you simply have three combatants, then the hatred of each for the other is much less. And my colleagues and I came up with a theory called moral foundations theory, based in part on the work of Richard Schwader, a, a, an anthropologist at the University of Chicago. And what we did is we said, um, okay, what are the taste buds of the moral sense? What are the the features, the, the intuitions that you find all over the world. It doesn't have to be in every single society, um, but what are the very, very common features that you see? And so uh, the list we came up with by looking at anthropology and evolution, because for each one we, we said there has to be an off-the-shelf evolutionary theory. We're not going to do armchair evolution and make stuff up. And so the five really clear matches were... Um, the first is care, care versus harm. And that comes right out of the attachment system. We're mammals. We care for our young. We're sensitive to harm. The second is um, fairness versus cheating. And there's work on reciprocal altruism. And every society has reciprocity. Uh, and the third is um, loyalty versus betrayal. Uh, we do coalitional psychology. Uh, the fourth is authority versus subversion. We're primates. We have deep, deep hierarchical psychology. We show deference the same way that other primates do. Uh, and the last uh, of the original five is called uh, sanctity versus degradation. This is something no other animal has, but we have this emotion of disgust. We, we um, see contamination. If A touches B and B touches C, then C takes on the properties of A. We have all kinds of magical beliefs. And you see this in religious practice, sacred objects. A lot of moral regulation is about who can touch what, when, and with what purification rituals beforehand. So those are the five original ones. There's a bunch more. We, we, we talk now about liberty versus oppression. I think property or possession is one. So there's, I am not, uh, I don't believe in parsimony. I don't believe that evolution gave a damn about parsimony or simplicity. And so the mind is just a lot of stuff in it. What we found empirically is that people on the left uh, in the United States, but we find this in most other countries we look at too, they tend to build their moral world on care, the, the care foundation, and then a version of fairness, which emphasizes equality. Those are the two main ones. 
um, people on the right, they have those concerns. They certainly love their children and their dogs with you know, their care, attachment. But their political theories, their, po- their social understandings are not based primarily on a sense of compassion for suffering. They're based more on a sense of fairness as um, just dessert, as proportionality. Do the, do the crime, do the time. Um, and then conservatives also build a lot more on group loyalty, uh, all the way out to nationalism, um, respect for authority, uh, you know, God and country, uh, respect your parents, and a sense of sanctity or purity, especially the social conservatives, the Christian conservatives. Um, libertarians are different. Libertarians are actually low on everything except for liberty. They really, really value liberty. Uh, and so what we, what we got um, beginning once, the, once Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act, and that sets in motion a, a set of tectonic changes whereby the Southern conservative Democrats begin shifting over to the Republican Party, just as President Johnson had predicted. Um, and then the liberal Republicans start getting either primaried or, or pushed out. So by the, only by the 1990s do we get a perfect sorting where we have two parties and anyone who's psychologically disposed to leftism or progressivism is now a Democrat, and anyone psychologically predisposed to um, conservatism or traditionalism or stability or order is now a Republican. And that means that the people on the other side really are odious. They really are different from, from us. It's not just that they have different material interests where we could compromise. No, no, no. Those people, they, and you can go through the list of the virtues that they don't have that your side does. And that's part of the reason why when you look at cross-partisan hatred, the degree to which people on both sides hate each other, it was pretty low in the 70s. I mean, the graphs from ANES, the American National Election Survey, show not much hatred. I mean, we didn't like people on the other side, but we didn't hate them. And we didn't mind so much if our children married someone from the other party. And since then, the hatred for the other side and the unwillingness to have your kids marry the other side has just gone up and up and up, and especially in the 2000s. And that's where we are today. Right. And so have those have those moral foundations stayed the same or kind of where do they stand now in, in 2019, <clears throat> you know, Donald Trump as, as president? Yeah. So the moral foundations never change. That's the whole metaphor is that they're foundations. Mm-hmm. But um, a, a political party, a political worldview... Is, is like a building, but that's too static a metaphor because, you know, even from, even over the course of every four years, the particular building changes. And so, uh, you know, what, um, what the left was in the early 80s, it was re- in the 70s and 80s, it was really drifting more towards sort of European leftism. And then Bill Clinton pulls it back and gives us a more centrist version, which is more pro business. Um, and uh, you know the Republicans, by many measures, began to radicalize, move further right in the in the 90s and 2000s. And now it's pretty clear the Demo- it's the Democrats' turn. Now they are building one that's much more uh, sympathetic to socialism. So they're con- each side. If you think about it, as each side constructs a moral matrix, and I mean matrix like the movie The Matrix, which uh, Gibson defined as a consensual hallucination. Um, A moral or political order is a consensual hallucination. We hallucinate it together. We pretend that it's real. It becomes real. We live in it, and we get angry within it. Right. And those are constantly in flux. Right. And and now, of course, we we tweet about it, and it all you know it's on cable news twenty four hours a day. Yeah. Those those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually ties to uh, another uh, kind of metaphor from from your previous work of the the elephant and the rider. So as I was going through the righteous mind, I wrote that um, twenty nineteen that it's like the elephants on steroids. <laughs> that's right. No, that's uh, right. Yeah. So can you can you explain to us what, what that, that mm-hmm. uh, metaphor means and how, how it relates to how we, mm-hmm. we view each other in a democracy. Sure. Politics is always a game of, it, it's driven by emotions and passions and interests. And then the, the job of the rider, the rider is not really in charge. The rider is really more of, as Hume said, a, a servant or a press secretary is a good mm-hmm. metaphor of the emotions. You see this in politics. Um, you know, we can justify anything our side wants, and then next year, you know, something flips and we justify the opposite, um, as we saw with the healthcare debate and all sorts of things. So if you think about it as this delicate balance between what we can articulate with our reasons and what we really want with our tribal emotions, and then you think of a healthy political order in which there are some restraints on what you can say, and there are social restraints where you can't just lie, and you can't say things that are just obviously untrue. They have to be at least justifiable. 
And so you imagine a system in some sort of balance um, with all that, and you have a stable political order. And then, just for fun, why don't we reach into the social network, the basic structure of society, and let's take all the cables connecting individuals to individuals, and let's um, suddenly change their capacity a hundredfold. Let's just make everyone really, really connected instantly to everyone else and able to respond to everyone else right away. And let's, you know, let's do this maybe around 2006, 2007. We'll start it. Uh, we'll call it Facebook. Uh, and then we'll have a lot of other platforms that do this. And let's also add a lot of video. Let's give everyone a video camera in their pocket so that everyone gets to take videos of the most outrageous things that people on the other side are doing and saying. And we'll give everyone a way that they can put into this sort of the social stream the most shocking, horrifying, outrage-inducing videos they can come up with. And we'll have a filtration process that only the really best ones are the ones that get sent to millions and millions of people. Um, and it, this can all happen within a few hours, or certainly a day or two is all it takes. Um, what happens to that delicate balance? It goes completely haywire in countries all around the world. And this is the main reason, I think, um, why it seems as though democracy is in big trouble and things are falling apart. There are a lot of trends. There's globalization, inequality. There are a lot of trends. But the, the, the sudden linking of everyone to everyone and with materials that outrage the elephant in the space of about five or ten years, I think, is the reason why things are really going to hell. Yeah, I mean, it's, which is which is kind of ironic as you think about it. These these tools on their face should be the most democratizing <clears throat> things out there, right? I mean, they, we've we've kind of had this this discussion on our show before about how they're also on the one hand used to organize people and connect people in in all these ways, but as you said, it's, it seems like there has to be some type of of a restraint or or kind of balance there that just doesn't. We never we've never quite gotten around to to that that piece of things. Well, that's right. So a lot of it depends on your view of human nature. And so this is one of the main things. So I started off on the left, and I started writing The Righteous Mind in order to help the Democrats win, because I couldn't stand it. They had no idea, like Al Gore and John Kerry, they had no idea how to talk about American morality. Um, so, uh, and so I began reading conservative writings in order to understand it. And in the process, I discovered you know, what John Stuart Mill told us all along, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. You just, you really don't know anything until you know the critic, criticisms of your view and you know whether uh, or not they're, they're valid. And so I learned a lot about conservatism and came to have tremendous respect for the philosophical tradition, not for the Republican Party, but for the conservative philosophical tradition. And so suppose the internet was developed only by people on the left. Um, by people who had no clue about conservative arguments or conservative ideas. Um, you might get something like this. Uh, this is from the founder of the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. So this is a particular lab at Stanford that taught a generation of people how to create devices and programs that will addict people, that will hook people. Um, so a lot of the architecture of our modern internet was created out of Stanford or the Bay Area. And uh, so, so here's what the founder of that lab said. Um, if I weren't an optimist about human nature, I would be worried about the future. But I am an optimist. I believe that we humans are fundamentally good. Now that persuasive technology is being put into the hands of millions of people, uh, da, 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 the tools for creating these systems are no longer given only to the highly trained. It's democratic. It's good. Let's connect. Let's empower. Yeah, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, but the point is, it was created by people who really didn't understand human nature. And had the internet been created by conservatives, um, they would have said, my God, you know, people are monsters unless they're constrained. We're not just going to connect everyone to everyone. And my God, there's going to be hacking. There's going to be all kinds of exploitation. We've got to build a really defensive internet. We can't just connect everyone. Um, now, unfortunately, you know, people on the right are more tradition oriented. They're not as creative or innovative. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of hate mail about this. Um, each side has its virtues. And I'm really big on the fact that it's when you put left and right together, you get a yin-yang. Each side really has something to contribute. Sure. So yeah, the internet was created by people who didn't understand human nature, and now I think it's wrecking our most valuable political systems. Right. And and on that point of, of putting left or right together, I, I see a lot, I hear a lot of calls for restoring civility. I see that hashtag mm -hmm. on Twitter all the time. What what do you what do you yeah. make of that? Is that the, the right approach <clears throat> given where things are and, and how well, we're yeah, wired? We, no, it, it's absolutely the right approach that we need to restore civility, but it's the wrong approach to thinking, hey, 
let's all just say we should restore civility and let's take a pledge. Let's sign a pledge. Um, you know, because what we really mean by civility is you guys need to be more civil. You guys need to stop doing what you're doing. Um, and <clears throat> and so um, I'm a social psychologist. Uh, I don't think we're going to get very far by training riders. I think we're going to um, get really far by changing the path that the elephant is on. And so anything that rewards call-out culture, anything that gives you prestige for shaming and humiliating others, for forwarding false or even true outrage materials, as long as the, the structural system, the, as long as the reward systems, the prestige economy does that, um, we're all just going to be continuing to choke on outrage. So it's going to take uh, changing the algorithms somehow to reward. Uh, so I think the word for 2019 should be nuance. That's my favorite mm -hmm. word now. And now that Twitter doubled its character length, whatever, a couple of years ago, now it's actually possible, even on Twitter, to sometimes say, I think you're right about X, but I disagree on Y. Like you can do that in 240 characters now. Um, and so if, we, if there was a way to reward nuance and to punish oversimplification or, or people who are frequent outragers, um, you know, if you think about it like CO2 pollution, like you know, we're, we're in a biosphere and if people are making a lot of smoke, you know, or like in the LA area, they're very sensitive to this, you know, it, um, if, and we're all choking on it. And in the same way, if you have a friend who keeps forwarding outrage articles, they're, they're just putting out smoke and we're all choking on it. And if there was a way to not quite shame them, but somehow make them less prestigious, that would help. All right. And this this ties to some of your work in, in your uh, latest book, the, the Coddling of the American Mind. From your work that, that you've done on Gen Z, what do you think we're, we're likely to see yeah. from them moving forward? The rap on democracies has always been that they tend to be weak, uh, inconsistent, driven by passion. And you know this is what Mussolini said about democracies in the 30s, and it wasn't clear in the 30s that democracy was the right way. Well, you know, Xi Jinping is doing a pretty darn good job of supporting Mussolini's critique of democracy. Any developing country that looks at America and looks at China and says, what kind of government do we want? I mean, they'd be crazy to take our form, at least in what they see now. Xi Jinping's authoritarian um, but we can sort of quite, we can call it authoritarian capitalism um, is delivering the goods, delivering growth, and ha giving stability. So, uh, so I think you know. So if you're growing up now as in America, you're not exactly going to be pro-China. But if someone asks you, is it absolutely essential to live in a democracy? Like, why would you say yes? Mm -hmm. Say maybe, probably it's pretty good, but not that good. Right, or you just don't have that that frame of reference. You don't maybe have the the historical background as yeah. well. We talk a lot about the the decline of civics education, um, and and kind of on that point of of education, I know you've you've also written about uh, the the uh, relationship between free play and democracy, which that's isn't right. one yeah. that you know people might might make uh, you know kind of readily. No, right. So so what is, what does that look like? In yeah. Your mind? So um, so I co-wrote this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, with my friend Greg Lukianoff. And we have a, we're trying to understand why is it that campus culture changed so quickly between 2014 and 2017? Not everywhere, but at the elite schools, especially in the Northeast, there's a new culture of safetyism in which students who, you know, the millennials um, who were college students in the early 2000s, the last of them graduated around 2015 or so, 2016. And so there's an enormous rise of self-perceived fragility uh, and uh, a lack of toughness, and people started commenting on how um, the Gen Z, the kids born in 1996 or later, uh, Gen Z is not able to solve basic problems for themselves. They expect adults to fix things if they're wrong. They're not self-reliant. They do not have the virtues of liberty that the founding fathers thought and that de Tocqueville praised in us. Why is this? Uh, so in our book, we go into six reasons or six reasons why this new culture came about so quickly. But the biggest one, the biggest single one, I believe, um, is that kids in America always were let out at the age of six. I, do, I give this talk all over the country. I always ask. And the mode is six. If you were born before 1982, if you're Gen X or older, you were let out in first grade. And you'd go outside and you'd play. And in play groups, there's a lot of research on play. In play, you learn to cooperate. You learn to set rules. You learn what to do when someone seems to have broken the rules. How do we adjudicate this? Uh, if some, some kids are really young, well, how can we incorporate them in play? We'll take it easy on them. So this is how you learn social skills is play, free play. And it has to be unsupervised. If there's an adult there to settle disputes, you learn nothing. No, wait a second. You learn how to appeal to adults. And so Gen Z 
It's the first generation in American history that was deprived of childhood. Um, we freaked out in the 90s and thought, even though the crime rate was plummeting, and actually the crime wave ended in the 90s, um, Americans began to think, because of the, we were frightened out of our minds by the media, that if we ever take our eyes off our kids outside, they will be abducted. And so in the 90s, we stopped letting kids out. And by the early 2000s, nobody had seen a child outside unsupervised in 10 years. And so in the early 2000s, you start hearing about adults who are arrested because their kid was caught playing outside. And so um, since we have a whole generation beginning with kids born in 1996 who didn't get to practice, they didn't get thousands and thousands of hours of practice of free play in mixed age groups where they had to set the rules and resolve disputes. Um, this, we believe, uh, is uh, they, they simply did not learn the skills of democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, de democracy requires setting rules, enforcing rules, changing rules, compromise, working it out. Um, uh, a self-governing people can solve this. Whereas what de Tocqueville was saying was that, well, my God, in France, if there's a problem, it takes an aristocrat to solve it or the government. Uh, and so I, I think democracy, is, our democracy is in real danger now. But when Gen Z becomes more politically active, you know, so in the 2030s when they're probably the largest group, let's say, um, I think our ability to govern ourselves will be much harder. Yeah, so that that runs counter to to a lot of of what we heard. Typically, people place their hope in 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 Gen Z. I think thinking about things like the the Parkland students and you know in, increased voter turnout uh, among mm -hmm. among Gen Z. But would you consider those things to be more, more outliers in terms of the well, so that yeah, so oh, yeah, overall, I, I have the opposite view. Mm -hmm. um, the, but the Parkland thing that was the one that was excellent, and the reason why that was excellent was um, the way the students responded to that is they actually did some research. Um, gun control is a complicated issue. Simple solutions are gonna backfire and not work. They actually did some research. And they came out with a, I think it was nine points, or I can't remember, but I read, I used to run a gun control group when I was in college. I know a lot about the issue. And I read it and said, my God, they really thought this through. And then they went to Tallahassee uh, and they protested and they tried, but they, they tried to get a law passed. Now they failed. Um, but they really did research and then they organized to apply pressure in the right place. That's about the only time I've seen that. So I think a lot of the Gen Z activism is very counterproductive. Um, activism divorced from research is a bad thing. Activism, it's just we're a bunch of young, angry people and we're going to demand that you do something which is probably going to backfire. That's a bad thing. So no, I, 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 am, I think that, you know, again, I don't blame Gen Z, Gen Z. We did this to them. We deprived them of childhood. But um, if if they you know if they if the if they all behave like the Parkland mm -hmm. students that'll be great but that's the only case I know of where they did that. You know, people who who listen to this show are concerned about democracy. They would not have sought out a podcast all about democracy if they weren't. So, uh, what what can people do? Or you know, what what's your what's your advice to concerned small D Democrats out there for for how to right the ship, so to speak? So I think we have to break it up into a couple of levels. So the first thing is we have to give kids back childhood to create more resilient kids. And this isn't, the argument here isn't, oh, if you love democracy. The argument is, oh, if you love your children. I mean, the rates of anxiety and depression are skyrocketing, especially for girls. So there is an urgent national health emergency that we have to stop overprotecting kids. We have to let them develop skills of independence. So that will pay off in about 30 years. If we could start doing that tomorrow, in 30 or 40 years, our democracy would be better. So that's one thing we have to start doing. Um, uh, secondly, I think we have to educate um, kids as if democracy was fragile and if it, as if it mattered. And so that means we have to be teaching skills of democratic engagement. And so, um, so first thing, so I co-founded an organization called LetGrow.org with Lenore Skenazy who wrote Free Range Kids. So anybody who has kids under 16, please go to LetGrow.org and you'll learn all kinds of ways to give your kid back childhood and to encourage your schools, your kids' schools. Um, to, uh, to raise stronger, healthier kids. Uh, second, in terms of teaching skills of interaction, I think that high schools should be teaching um, politics in a very different way. That is, um, teachers and social studies teachers in particular tend to be on the left. Um, they either don't teach anything about conservatism or they, some of them let their politics intrude. Um, and I think we should be teaching great respect for the long philosophical traditions of left and right, and then teaching skills of democratic discourse. 
Um, we're going to end uh, now, as we always do, with our four uh, Mood of the Nation poll questions. So, again, this will be kind of like a lightning round. Um, thinking specifically about American politics, what makes you angry? What makes me angry um, is, as I said, uh, corruption. The the fact that uh, you know the fact that people can buy influence. Um, you know, money always speaks, but we have to do everything we can to reduce the volume that it, it speaks at. Um, so that's just there's that's a should be a bipartisan thing. We've got to get you know this isn't about which team wins. This is about the integrity of the rules of the game. Uh, what makes you proud? Uh, well, as I said, I just saw Hamilton, and I, I, it was the best play I have ever seen, and like my heart was just bursting. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just to remember how great this country really is, and how amazing its founding was, and the miracle that we had those men thinking those thoughts, engaged in the kinds of conflicts that they were engaged in, other than the duels. I wish we didn't have the duels. Um, so that really uh, re-triggered my, my sense of pride in being an American. Uh, what makes you worry? What makes me worry is Gen Z. What makes me worry is that with the best of intentions, we have overprotected kids born after 1996, uh, and therefore we have deprived them of the virtues and skills of democratic self-government. And then finally, what gives you hope? Um, my first answer, because you, you, know, you told me before and you might ask me this, and I was thinking nothing. Nothing gives me hope. But, but, I, you know, but let's be realistic here. Um, so despite my pessimism, I always, I always carry around a little inner Steve Pinker. So Steve Pinker, cognitive psychologist at Harvard, uh, he has a couple of books, The Better Angels of Our, of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, in which he, he, you know, his career now is basically combating people like me who are pessimists. You know, we're friends. I, I, I respect him greatly. But you know, Steve is always reminding us that throughout history, not at every time, but many points in history, people are incredibly pessimistic, yet things have gotten better and better. There are temporary reversals, but they're always temporary. Um, GDP is going up, education is going up, health is going up, almost every good thing. If you care about human experience, human welfare, human rights, the big picture is amazingly good over the last 50 years, and it continues to get better. Nick Kristof writes mm -hmm. about this also. He says, he, you know, each year he says, guess what, guys? Last year was the best year in human history. So even though, and so here's the main thing. When I look at the trends for our democracy, they're mostly down. And if present trends continue, then we will fall apart and we will fail as a nation. But present trends never continue. The worse things get, the more people come in to try to work on them. So one thing we can say for sure is that not all present trends will continue and many will reverse. So you know, my feeling is pessimistic, but the rider, the rational part is at least saying, you know, odds are things will be better 30 years from now than they are today. Great. Well, that is, is a great place to leave things. John, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. We've just been sitting here thinking, well, where do we go with that? There is just so much to right, talk about. talked about so much. Right. And, and, uh, and all of it is... I mean, that is, is what's so interesting about his work. It yeah. just takes in... It goes in so many different directions. Right. You know, able to talk about philosophy, psychology politics, history, uh, bring things together. And, you know, the modern university is so hyper-specialized uh, that we just don't get a lot of people these mm -hmm, days uh, mm -hmm. it, that, that are able to do that. Well, I mean, there's some scientists we think about yeah, as real public right. intellectuals, mm -hmm. but from a social scientist perspective, I, I have a hard time thinking about anybody quite in, in Jonathan's league. And, and just, I mean, and I, I couldn't agree more. The other thing is just, you know, seeing the talk yesterday, just how thirsty people are for that. You know, I have to say, probably the first of our guests who, when we've asked our four questions mm -hmm. to about what are you, angry, hopeful, uh, when it came to hope, did not put all his hope in, you know, right. the next generation of kids. How often have we heard that answer? My hope is in the next right. generation. My right. hope is in the future. My hope is in the Parkland kids. And uh, while he did talk quite uh, positively about the Parkland kids, although maybe in a different way than, than we've talked about them at, at, at different times on this show. You know, he's, he's concerned mm -hmm. about this generation of college kids. He's teaching on a college campus, right. and he's concerned. Right. No, and, and um, you know, who knows, right? I mean, um, it is, it, it just strikes me as, you know, unlikely that, these Gen Z folks are are going to prevail against well, the world, right? They're going to get out the. They're going to find out well, that it's not this way, and they're going to have to adjust. So, Michael, what do you th what do you think about um, what Jonathan said about this kind of, you know, his his 
the the lines that he tells himself not to get too overly depressed and to see this kind of these short term trends within the context of these longer and more um, much more positive trends towards human rights and freedom and and health and you know people getting fed and things like that. Right. On the one hand, we're doing better than we ever have. Right. We humanity. Yeah, humanity is mm-hmm. doing better than it ever has. I don't know that democracy is necessarily doing better than it ever has no. these days. And I mean, I'm struck by this idea that Martin Luther King used to talk about that the uh, arc of justice. Uh, the arc of history bends towards justice. Is long, but bends towards justice. Is long, but bends towards justice. And of course, uh, Barack Obama, mm-hmm. uh, with a campaign of hope, mm-hmm. uh, used to re- rely on that that quite a bit as mm-hmm. well. But maybe the arc of history uh, bends towards authoritarianism. Well, maybe maybe democracy is is just a moment, and that democracy. Because it is so on hard, so hard. Because mm-hmm. it is so unnatural, mm-hmm. which is really his right, argument, right. Mm-hmm. essentially. Right. Uh, and because we're seeing these models in, for example, China of authoritarian capitalism, uh, where you can have fast economic growth and people's standard of living can increase, mm-hmm. but without dem- democracy, right. uh, that maybe you know. Maybe the arc of justice, maybe the arc of history does not bend towards right. justice or at least not towards democracy. You know, I mean, so I think what that uh, the response that requires is to um, nuance, which is a word he wanted uh, or wants to 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 uh, put forward the the idea of unnaturalness. Right. Because while, yeah, there are things about democracy that are unnatural, there is also um, naturally, this um, um, desire in the you know in the breast of every human being to be free and do what they want, right? And to say this is what I believe, and I don't want you telling me what to believe. And and I don't think that is any less natural than um, than our kind of like you know this kind of uh, uh, respect for authority and things like that. And and so it may just be that you know. I mean, you know, I've actually said this in another context that the democracy is is not great, but it's the least worst. And and I and I would continue to you know put that forward as as an argument that that you know we have to live together, um, and and we all deserve to have certain prerequisites to how we live, and democracy is the least worst way for us to do that. You know, it's it's natural and easy for us to look at trends in, you know, five, ten-year increments, over 50 years, who knows? We just don't know. Well, good point. And, and I mean, we'll be do demo- doing democracy work in 50 years. We'll be I, talking about the hard work of democracy, and we could come back. Somebody and, else might. <laughs> you don't think we'll be here? <laughs> I, no, I don't. But, you know, who knows? <laughs> Andy will still be here. That's right. Somebody will still be here. Somebody will still be keeping up the, you know, picking up the mantle. And, uh, you know, anyway. So uh, from the Corning Institute for Democracy at Penn State in the studios of WPSU, I'm Chris Beam. And I'm Michael Berkman. And this has been Democracy Works. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU Penn State. Our hosts are Michael Berkman, Chris Beam, and me, Jenna Spinelli. Andy Grant is our engineer, and Mark Stitzer is our editor. Additional support comes from Emily Reddy, Shireen Stanford, Craig Johnson, and the rest of the team at WPSU. For detailed show notes and discussion questions for each episode, visit our website at democracyworkspodcast.com. And if you like what you heard today, please consider rating or reviewing us wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.